another post. In February of 43, he was replaced by Colonel Noel F. Parrish. One of his first actions was to remove all the colored only and whites only signs from around the base. Colonel Parrish, now that is my man. We called him affectionately our great white father because he supported us. It wasn't a popular thing for a white officers to do. Parrish's sense of fairness extended to the military instructors, who initially were all white. The uh, white instructors were just as good and just as friendly and just as uh, encouraging. Goldberg was my instructor. Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, he beat me to death with the uh, hitting that stick and uh, beat my hand on and, and make sure that I did it right. Instructor pilots were very difficult with white cadets as well as black cadets, so they, they got very, very good training. Still, two out of three cadets washed out. Many might have been good enough to have earned their wings in an unsegregated military, but there were only 30 or so slots in the all-black 99th Squadron. That just shows the full hardiness. You bring all these pilots in, and you get rid of them. It just totally makes no sense. But Charles Dryden and Span Watson made it, and the decades since have done little to diminish the thrill of that graduation day. I wasn't a braggart, but I was proud. And they pinned those wings on me, my heart was beating like a trip hammer, and I thought it was going to leap right out of my chest. They had earned their wings, but this highly trained unit remained grounded. Their frustrating wait for the chance to fight. That's next on War Stories. November 1942. Led by General Dwight David Eisenhower, the Allied invasion of German-held North Africa begins with Operation Torch. On Christmas Day, 23-year-old Lee Archer from New York City arrived at Tuskegee, Alabama for pilot training. I didn't think I was making a stand for the future of the country or any race relations. With me, it was mostly in your face. You tell I can't do it, baloney. I'll prove it to you I can. As Archer trained to fly the P-40, George Boland, Span Watson, and Charles Dryden were still waiting to ship out. For Dryden, it had been almost a year since he graduated, but nobody knew what to do with the black pilots. Why can't the black pilots be sent overseas to fight for their country like any other American pilot? I didn't bother myself with those questions. I'm ready whenever it comes, if it comes. I can find my energy and effort to be the best damn pilot that I could be. 99th became certainly one of the best trained fighter squadrons in the Army Air Corps because they had so much time to spend at Tuskegee training. Finally, on 1 April 1943, they received their orders. You really are shocked when you find your name on a list of people to be sent into the war zone. So when did you actually physically get on the ship and head over? We left Tuskegee by train, went up to Camp Shanks, New York, along the Hudson River. Um, and we were there for two weeks, being outfitted with all winter stuff, so we thought we'd go to the Battle of Britain. But they weren't. They were heading to North Africa. On 15 April, 400 members of the 99th Squadron and 3,500 white troops boarded the SS Mariposa. Ironically, the highest ranking man on board the segregated ship was a Tuskegee Airman, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Davis. He was the troop commander of the whole vehicle. One morning we uh, woke up. Beautiful day, beautiful day. I'll never forget it. And there was Casablanca. Once captured, North Africa would be used as a staging area for invading Italy. Once they got to Africa, they didn't know what to do with them. The next day after we landed, we then were herded on board some uh, trains. It took us about 75 miles into the interior. And uh, they had cut us out of a big circle to be used as a simulated bombing, you know, practice your job bomb. And practice they did. We were there for about two weeks before we got brand new P-40s. They practiced with the legendary Phil Cochran, more training that would prove invaluable. He knew the Germans' tactics, and he spent a week with us teaching us what he knew. Then we were deployed to a place called Farjuna in Tunisia. My first mission was an escort mission, and uh, my second mission was uh, just fly over the island of Pantelleria and drop bombs on it. 
Pamelaria is a rocky 42 square mile Mediterranean island 63 miles off the coast of Sicily. A stepping stone on the march to the European mainland, Eisenhower decided that Pamelaria, occupied by 10,000 mostly Italian troops, had to be taken. In June of 43, the 99th joined the 33rd Fighter Group as part of Operation Corkscrew, the heavy aerial bombardment of the island. On 9 June, Dryden, Watson, and four others broke formation and chased after four attacking German Messerschmitts. They became the first black Army Air Corps pilots to engage the enemy in aerial combat. But the move would later come back to haunt them. And who one of us? Would it be the first black to shoot down one of those SLBs? And it was that point that my fear disappeared, because I knew I was a tiger, not a pussycat. You're terrified up to the point that you get shot at, and you know the mission is a success, and you therefore develop this egotistical way of doing things, because uh, they can't hit you. Coming up on War Stories, George Bowling's P-40 is crippled by anti-aircraft fire, forcing him into the Mediterranean. In the late spring of 1943, Operation Corkscrew, the round-the-clock bombing campaign of Pandelaria was a resounding success. The 10,000 mostly Italian troops on the island surrendered on 11 June. For the first time in history, a devastating aerial bombardment resulted in surrender before ground troops could invade, and the 99th Squadron was instrumental in the operation's success. Does anybody stop by and say, well done, guys? No. <laughs> oh, not indeed. We ended up being assigned to the 33rd Fighter Group, commanded by our Colonel William Mobile. But uh, it certainly did not welcome us. The 99th spent the rest of that summer on escort missions over Sicily, frequently fending off attacks from German aircraft. 2 July marked their first kill. Charlie Hall from Brazil, Indiana. He shot down a Falkworth 190. But the day's victory was bittersweet. Lieutenants Sherman White and James McCullen were killed in a mid-air collision. A week later, the squadron was ordered to fly aerial cover missions to support the Allied invasion of Sicily. The P-40 that we were flying didn't have long range, and therefore flying over to Sicily from North Africa, 150 miles over water, we had to fly over, do you, whatever you had to do, and go right back. But over Sicily on 11 July, things didn't go as planned for George Bowling. We noticed these aircraft coming in, and so we took chase. The enemy aircraft were over the invasion fleet, and so was I. When the fleet opened fire on the enemy aircraft, Bowling was caught in the crossfire. There were bullets just flying everywhere. One of these bullets struck my airplane. I thought I was going to uh, be on fire or something. But uh, I checked my instruments and I had no uh, oil pressure. He was forced to bail out at 3,000 feet, straight into the Mediterranean Sea. I found out then how small a dinghy can be in the Mediterranean Sea. And it was quite a, quite a lesson in uh, mortality. All night, out there, I uh, just sat there and hoped, prayed. The following morning, Bowling spotted a U.S. destroyer on the horizon. I did everything I could to holler and wave, and that ship went on by and uh, disappeared. And uh, I was lonely again. And the next thing I noticed, it was coming back. This time, directly at me. I said, my goodness, they want to run me down. But instead, they pulled up alongside and pick me up. In September of 43, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Davis was recalled home to train more black pilots at Selfridge Field, Michigan. His beloved 99th came under attack from Colonel William Momeyer. He wrote this very scathing report. Um, the gist of it was that in large part he accused the black pilots of being cowards. Momeyer at one point criticizes the lack of German kills. Well, the first time that one of us did shoot down, we proved that we, we weren't cows who were going to turn and run. 
Momar's report said the 99th, quote, have failed to display the aggressiveness and desire for combat that are necessary to a first-class fighting organization. He also reported that when jumped by enemy aircraft, the squadron seemed to fall apart and used as an example when Dryden, Spann, and the others broke formation over Pandelaria to pursue attacking enemy aircraft. That just wasn't true. We were, we were not afraid to fly, and he knew that. In September of 43, Time magazine asked, quote, is the Negro as good a soldier as the white man? The Tuskegee Airmen certainly answered that question. That's next when War Stories returns. By September 43, Sicily was in Allied hands. That month, the Italians decided they'd had enough and surrendered, but that didn't bring peace. Hitler ordered the invasion of Italy, allowing Mussolini to establish a fascist republic. The battle for Italy would be long and fierce. Early that September, Allied troops led by Britain's Field Marshal Montgomery and American General Mark Clark landed on the southern end of the Italian boot. Back in the States, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Davis was given command of the 332nd Fighter Group. Comprised of three all-black fighter squadrons, they were stationed at Selfridge Field, Michigan. They formed the 100, 301st, and 302nd Fighter Squadron, which they called the 332nd Fighter Group. They moved us out of Tuskegee up to Selfridge Field, Michigan. While we were up there, we had riots up there. They say we were troublemakers. What was the cause of the friction up in Michigan? The pilots wanted to go into the officers' club. The government made these officers join the club. They took money out to pay, yet they wouldn't let the blacks go in there. They go in there, they had a riot. And another incident happened, the, the base commander up there, uh, they sent a black uh, Negro to be his chauffeur, and he shot him. Private McRae survived. The base commander, Colonel William Coleman, was found guilty of careless use of firearms and conduct prejudicial to good order and military discipline. Congressman Paul Schaefer called the verdict a farce and disgustingly inadequate. Secretary of War Stimson agreed and ousted Coleman from the Army with a reduction of rank to captain. There was a general attitude on the part of a lot of people in the military that this program needed to fail. Race riots in a Time magazine article based on Colonel Molmeyer's critical report had potentially grave consequences for the Tuskegee Airmen. In October of 43, Agatha Davis, Colonel Davis's wife, wrote to the editor of Time magazine condemning their coverage of the Tuskegee Airmen. She said, quote, these few printed words have struck at one of the strongest pillars upholding Negroes' morale. During the uproar, Colonel Davis was called before the War Department's Committee on Special Troop Policies to defend the squadron. His testimony was bolstered when famed war correspondent Ernie Pyle publicly championed the 99th. Support even came from the front lines in the form of General Eisenhower, who believed Momeyer's claims were false. And the McCoy Commission read through it, and their finding was that the Black pilots were every bit as good as anybody else. It was popular to say that a Negro couldn't fly. Blacks weren't up to it. We were. In January of 44, 60,000 men led by General John P. Lucas stormed ashore at Anzio. This was a second chance to break the German hold on Italy. It also marked a turning point for the Tuskegee Airmen. That two days stretch. Seventeen Germans were shot down by the members of the Nine Squadron. Seventeen in two days. And that's when the world began to realize, oh, they could do it. As the war progressed, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, was very laudatory, and, and Hap Arnold also uh, you know, wrote some very glowing reports. As the 99th blasted the enemy out of the sky, Benjamin Davis and three more squadrons sailed to join them. We went over in a convoy of ships. They were loading 500-pound bombs on this ship. They load all these bombs on, put the planks down, and marched us down onto the ship. One of the older troops, they say, you see what happened? Now they're going to take us out in the ocean and going to blow up the ship. Nobody ever going to hear about us anymore. <laughs> and we believed it. Did they pack up your planes? No, just we, the troops. Just the troops. We went into Toronto and then 
bust over the hills to, to the Naples area. Charles McGee, George Watson, and Lee Archer joined the fight. They suddenly changed us to another aircraft called the P-39. Not much of a combat aircraft as far as I was concerned. It had four machine guns, two in each wing, and had a 37 millimeter cannon in the nose. And uh, the engine was behind you. You crashed the airplane, the engine would fall on you, the gas tanks would spill gas and you'd burn. It was a terrible airplane. It wasn't good for air-to-air -air combat. So they were transferred from the 39 to the P-47 for escort. The 47 capabilities. Really a very rugged aircraft. 50 caliber. 50 caliber machine. Four. Four on each side. Make a pretty big hole. Pretty it? big hole, right. I think the most untold story and the most important of the Tuskegee experience is the work of the mechanics. I mean, they literally just take a new airplane, park it out there, and say, you guys are now fixing this one. That's right. Now, there was no time to go off to engine school and did it right there. In July of 44, the 99th became part of the 332nd Fighter Group. The four squadrons were stationed at Ramatelli, Italy. Their primary mission, bomber escort. The bomber pilots, they didn't realize that they were being escorted by black pilots. You looked over and you saw someone wearing an oxygen mask, a helmet, gloves. Strategic bombing took place day and night, often involving hundreds of aircraft dropping thousands of tons of bombs hundreds of miles behind the front lines. For accuracy, the Americans used B-17s and B-24s to bomb by daylight. In order to hit their targets, the massive formations lumbered along just over 200 miles an hour on fixed altitudes and headings. They were juicy targets for enemy fighters that could reach speeds well over 300 miles an hour. For protection, American fighters escorted the bombers. But the bombers also bristled with 50 caliber machine guns. So much stuff going on. Absolutely. Did you get shot at by a friend? Not to my awareness, but we we did become very conscious that uh, you needed to come up and let them see who you are. Don't come flying straight in. Hoping to limit friendly fire casualties, squadrons began painting parts of their aircraft different colors. I'd say either the tips, the nose were red first. Do you remember whose idea it was? No, I don't. Why the red tails? I guess it just happened that from the supply point of view, red paint was available. They came to be known as the red tails, and their new paint scheme would adorn yet another new airplane. With a top speed of over 400 miles per hour, the P-51 Mustang solved a long-standing problem. Earlier fighters couldn't stay with the bombers on their longest missions. The P-51 could. My airplane that I loved most of all was the P-47. But I admit, uh, if I didn't, they would kill me, that the 51 was a better aircraft. When the bombers were briefed that the Red Tails were going to escort, they had a very strong sense of survival. Their fame, if you will, started to spread to the point where they were being, their services were being requested. The Tuskegee Airmen were quite literally saviors to the boys and the bombers, a fact the bomber boys never forgot. Some of the other pilots from other squadrons uh, didn't like that idea of staying up there with us. But the Tuskegee Airmen, they stayed up there and flew formation like they were supposed to. We were coming home that we lost an engine and we were out of the group by ourselves. And we called for a fighter escort to go home with us. And it happened to be a Tuskegee Airman that came to get us. He was real classy flying that P-51 out there on our wing brought us home. The Tuskegee Airmen knew that their CO, Benjamin Davis, expected a lot of them. He told me, we, we had the mission of escorting bombers. If you lose a bomber, don't go home. As simple as that. Well, we don't know what he would have done because we never lost one. Never. Coming up on War Stories, Colonel Davis leads the group on a grueling 1,600-mile mission deep into the heart of Germany. By the fall of 44, victory in Europe was less than a year away. 
at home, FDR won an unprecedented fourth term. And in the Pacific, General MacArthur fulfilled his promise and returned to the Philippines. The Tuskegee Airmen continued to prove their doubters wrong. We saw enemy fighters, and uh, I got on the tail of the enemy 109. I was pegging it. And it went over, and the guy bailed out. And the fellow landed and was standing there, and I came down. I flew over him and locked my wings and pulled up and did a slow roll. A stupid thing like that, which is what I thought being a fighter pilot was all about. On 12 October, Lee Archer strapped on his P-51 and lifted off. We're coming back from a big mission, and I guess the Germans had gotten tired of us flying over their country. They sent up a fleet of airplanes. I don't think I've ever seen so many airplanes in the world not controlled all over the place. Truthfully, I remember thinking then my big worry was not that I'd get shot down, but that some idiot would run into me. I ended up lucky. I got three. And he came home, and it went through the system, and they proved it. Those three kills would have given Lee Archer five air-to-air -air victories, making him an ace, the first Tuskegee Airman to reach this mythical status. A month after that happened, we get a notice they're reviewing the first one, and they're giving me a half a credit. And I let it go. I said, the heck with it. Uh, at the time, I think I said something about uh, the victory and... Uh, 10 cents would get me a ride in the subway and I'd get the subway for 10 cents without it. It was just plain racist. I don't think they were ready for a, a, a black guy to be called an ace. War Stories contacted the Air Force Historical Research Agency regarding Archer's record. After reviewing these files, we were told his official total for now is four air-to-air -air victories. The Tuskegee M was going on escort bombers to Berlin the next day. We only had 75 gallon tanks on the base, so we needed 110 gallon wing tanks. Berlin was over 1,600 miles away. Without the larger tanks, the Red Tails wouldn't be able to stay with the bombers out and back. Technical Sergeant George Watson was there when the supply team found some 110 gallon tanks on a train. I rode in the jeep with this one officer. We only had one one officer. We went to the depot. The officer told us to stay out. He went in there and said, we need some 110 gallon wing tanks because the Tuskegee were going on a mission tomorrow. He said, we have 110 gallon wing tanks, but it's not for you people. He said, it's going to another outfit. So we took off and went down where this train was. Now we had a semi-circle with our weapons pointing at the engine. It was an American staff sergeant in charge of this train. When this guy looked around and saw us, he put his hands up. So the officer said, okay, uh, back the, the flatbeds up to there and get those 110 gallon wing tanks. A lot of the, the original Tuskegee Gamma, they say, that as a the great train robber World War II. I said, don't call it Green Tree Mob. He said, what are we going to call it? I said, call it Operation Fuel Tank. It sounds better, you know? Seven weeks later, the war in Europe ended. Many of the troops in Europe were pegged ahead for the Pacific in the invasion of Japan. But the Tuskegee Airmen weren't among them. When the war in Europe ends, there's no consideration given to moving those squadrons to the Pacific Theater? Apparently not at that time, at least for a black unit. Victory didn't bring an end to segregation. The Tuskegee Airmen come home when War Stories returns. The overall code name for the invasion of Japan was Operation Downfall. The cost in lives was expected to be monumental. Planners anticipated as many as a million American and two million Japanese casualties. Even two atomic bombs didn't bring Japan's immediate surrender. But six days after the second atomic bomb, Japan's Emperor Hirohito spoke to his people, telling them the war was over. With Japan's surrender, the invasion plan was scrapped. Millions of Americans came home to the victor's welcome they so well deserved. But for the Tuskegee Airmen, some things hadn't changed. When I came home from World War II, after having flown 169 combat missions, I came home and the first sign I ever saw at the foot of the gangplank was said colored troops to the left and white troops to the right, separated again. So you get these punches in the guts every once in a while, and it should make you hate everybody. 
but yeah, then you have to kind of balance it with all the good guys from the other side that you've met. And if, if you've got any reasoning power at all, you realize that this is certain individuals. It's not uh, a worldwide uh, thing. There were German prisoners of war who could do things that we couldn't do in our country. And we'd just been fighting to defend our country against the enemy. And some of the soldiers, they could sit anywhere in the basic theater. We had to sit in a segregated code section. They could go into the PX and have a meal that was off limits to us. I got so mad. I couldn't believe that I got you a teacher. Why did you stay in the Air Force after the war? My dream was always to play a pilot. Flying the best Uncle Sam had. They couldn't find jobs other than working as porters or or road crews or construction labor and, and being in the military is not a bad job uh, so they decided to stay uh, but it was not always easy you're doing pretty well for yourself but you're still segregated so you don't like it what can you do about it you know i was gonna wait and find out what i could do about it in 1947 the air corps ceased to exist and the air force was born a year later President Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9981, desegregating the military. It came more than 15 years before the 1964 Civil Rights Act finally abolished civilian Jim Crow laws. What was worst, the worst organization in the world is probably now the leading organization for equality, for integration, and for equal treatment. But change wasn't instantaneous. In 1954, Span Watson was attending the Air Force Command and Staff School in Alabama. Like a lot of career military, he enjoyed getting his hair cut once a week. But the base barbershop refused to cut a black man's hair. And this is supposed to be the enlightened center in the Air Force. After five years, this is all you've got. And what do you want to do, sell me integration on a thousand-year endowment? George Bowling stayed in the Air Force and retired as a major. He saw military desegregation as a sign of better things to come. I was at that time in California at Sacramento. We had a brigadier general in charge of the base there, General McDaniels, I think was his name. He told the entire command that I have an order here from Washington, signed by the president, that uh, we're going to integrate this base. I've never heard such strong talk. Benjamin Davis continued to serve, and in 1998, President Bill Clinton promoted him to four-star general. Technical Sergeant George Watson dedicated 26 years to the Air Force, serving overseas in England and in Germany. Were you better off for having served? Oh, yes. I know I am. Yes, sir. Span Watson, Charles Dryden, Lee Archer all stayed with the Air Force and all rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel. I was asked last week by a young man said uh, why did you do it and I gave him the story that uh, you fight for your rights you argue you do anything you have to, to to get what you think you deserve but when the country's in trouble you drop that he says well Colonel would you do it again I couldn't answer him right away but I finally said yes I would if I thought I said the payment is late but we've received the payment, and that's all you can expect. Charles McGee retired as a colonel. What do you want that youngster to know about Tuskegee and what you went through? Even though things aren't always perfect, and in our case, in a democracy, uh, there's no better way of life. You can set a goal, but you've got to do some work, doing your best, not letting uh, obstacles deter you from accomplishing that, that goal. If you think negatively, you're taking yourself out of a posture to do your best because you're, you're looking the wrong way. There is a, a good side to everything, and that's what you should see. More on the saga of the Tuskegee Airmen when War Stories continues. This old tower here at Tuskegee doesn't look like much today. But the legacy of the men who trained here is intact. At the U.S. Air Force Academy, the inscription on the statue dedicated to them reads, the Tuskegee Airmen, 
rose from adversity through confidence, courage, commitment, and capacity to serve America on silver wings and to set a standard few will transcend. Today, minorities serve in every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. The daring deeds of the Tuskegee Airmen help pave the way for today's soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, and Marines. Every American owes them a debt of gratitude for the enemies they vanquished abroad and the racism they overcame here at home. Theirs is a war story that deserves to be told. I'm Oliver North. Good night.